Good evening. And Happy New Year. I'm Loa Traxler. I'm the Associate Deputy Director here at the Penn Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you out on this frosty evening. We're glad to see so many of you for our first evening lecture of 2012. I have two announcements to draw your attention to a couple events uh, coming up. Tomorrow evening, in the same auditorium, we have another illustrated presentation by Dr. Patrick McGovern. He will be presenting the opening night lecture as part of the annual meeting for the Archaeological Institute of America sessions, which are going on downtown. He'll be presenting at 6 o'clock tomorrow night here in the Harrison Auditorium, a presentation entitled Uncorking the Past, Ancient Ales, Wines, and Extreme Beverages. <laughs> this event, even though it's part of a conference, it's free, it's open to the public, and we encourage you to come back. And also mark your calendars for our next Great Littles Riddles Lecture that comes up on the 1st of February, again, here in this auditorium. We will have Dr. Thomas Tarteran, who is an, associate, an assistant professor in the Classical Studies Department here at Penn. He's going to be talking to us about Utsi, the Iceman, which will be quite fun. It'll get you very much in that winter mood. <laughs> this evening, we have a genuine pleasure of, of having a presentation by Dr. Clark Erickson. He is professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania here in the Department of Anthropology. He is also the curator of the South American collections here in the American section of the Penn Museum. Since the 1970s, Dr. Erickson's Andean and Amazonian research has focused on the contribution of archeology span to understanding the complex history of human involvement with the environment and how cultural activities have literally shaped the earth. Dr. Erickson uses historical ecology along with landscape and applied archeology span to understand the long-term dynamic relationship um, between humans and the environment around us. His research explores indigenous knowledge systems, especially those pertaining to native agricultural practices, as well as sustainable land use and the cultural landscape, both its structure and the aesthetics that surround it. Throughout his career, Dr. Erickson has been a leading figure promoting collaboration with descendant indigenous communities in areas of applied research projects, particularly those that have the potential for sustainability and sustainable development. His work with the Quechua communities in Peru, the Kofan in Ecuador, and the Arawak in Bolivia stand out in this particular regard. He's the author and editor of numerous scientific and popular publications, most recently an edited book entitled Landscapes of Movement, published with his co-editors James Sneed and Andrew Darling in 2009 by this museum. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the University Research Foundation, um, the American Philosophical Society, and numerous regional foundations. His most recent work focuses on pre-Columbian cul cultural landscapes and the contemporary inhabitants thereof throughout the wetlands, forests, and savannas of Bolivia, particularly along the Amazon River Basin. This evening, however, Dr. Erickson explores the mystery of El Dorado, the golden city a long-sought destination of conquistadors, explorers, treasure hunters. Tonight, Dr. Erickson will help us understand the origins of this myth and the popularity of the idea of El Dorado. Please welcome Dr. Clark Erickson. I'd like to start off with a question. Who does not like gold? Raise your hand. Gold and other precious metals have played a major role in shaping world history. Most human societies, past and present, have appreciated gold, given it meaning, symbolism, and value, even if they don't have direct access to its sources. Some societies, such as we'll hear about tonight, went to great effort to find it. Museums also value and appreciate gold, um, especially that made into impressive objects. Museums such as ours often recycle our collection into repeated traveling exhibits and loans, but the public never gets tired of seeing it, and these are some of the best attended exhibits that we have. Archaeology has a long involvement also with gold. In the past, finding a royal tomb or a cache of treasure could bring instant fame, funding, and a professional career. 
Conquistadors, explorers, treasure hunters, and many others have long sought the fabled El Dorado or Golden City, or often um, in the earlier accounts, the Golden Man. Throughout this history, elaborate stories and myths have circulated the, about the existence of such a place. And these bits of evidence have been assembled um, to prove its reality at various points in um, the historical record. This presentation explores the origins of El Dorado, briefly, um, some of the complex narratives that circulate, and the historical, ethnographic, and archaeological information that help us understand the popularity of the concept of El Dorado through time. El Dorado has also been a place um, of contact uh, um, between Europeans and the Americas. Um, El Dorado was actually looked for by the Incas and probably pre-Inca peoples also, so it goes back even before the arrival of Europeans. Explorers such as De Soto, Nunez de, uh, Cabeza de Vaca, uh, sought it in North America, Cortez and his followers in Mesoamerica and Central America. This, uh, this presentation will focus on El Dorado case studies from South America, or in particular the Amazon region of the lowlands. The search um, drove exploration and conquest of South America, and to many Spanish conquistadors, El Dorado was not a myth. They found lots of gold and silver, um, especially in the early years. So who hasn't dreamed of finding unknown treasures, particularly gold of great importance and value? I'm guilty myself. After reading the book Gods, Graves, and Scholars and another book called All About Archaeology in the sixth grade, I knew I wanted to be an archaeologist and find similar sites uh, described in these books. Now, what is my expertise and background in the theme of El Dorado? Well, I starred in this documentary, The Secret of El Dorado, and um, I... Um, uh, for good or for bad, I uh, argued with the uh, director about, I said, I do not want any of these names in the title <laughs> here because they're so you know, ubiquitous. Uh, any documentary you see on the past usually has, you know, so what did he do? He put two of the words in the same, in the single title. Um, and I've also been working um, much of my career in the realm of Paititi, uh, another name for El Dorado in the Bolivian Amazon, which I'll talk about today. Um, and my website continue gets linked to ancient astronauts, mysteries of the past, Atlantis websites, and also El Dorado websites for some reason. Can't see her. Um, El Dorado has drawn a number of very uh, impressive characters. Um, there are many biographies written in Spanish and English and other languages about many of the characters that I'll briefly talk about uh, tonight. Uh, two of the most probably uh, famous in the popular uh, mind are Francisco Pizarro, who conquered the Incas, and also Lope, uh, Lupe, Lope de, de Guerra. Also, uh, some more modern um, Explorers, um, you've certainly heard about Hiram Bingham, uh, who led the Yale University expedition to Machu Picchu, and I talked about that here last year. And also uh, Percy Fawcett, who uh, has become um, famous recently again um, for um, a couple of um, biographies written about him. And then also in popular film, and a lot of this comes directly out of a lot of these early eyewitness accounts by the Spanish, and especially some of the themes in the last Indiana Jones um, movie uh, touched upon uh, El Dorado and Paititi. Um, much of this starts with the conquest of Mexico and the Aztecs and the Maya, which I'm not going to talk about in any great detail. In this, I'm not going to talk about in this lecture. But it was from the stories and participation of Francisco Pizarro, a young conquistador at the time, uh, decided that he wanted to have access to his own treasures. And so he started exploring south uh, with a number of other colleagues to try to find what had been rumored of a civilization with lots of gold and silver to the south. So he did. Uh, three exploratory expeditions to the south um, in a well-financed expedition, most of this finance on his own uh, funding. And one of the lucky things is that um, one of his colleagues ran across one of these ocean-going rafts that was probably going from Peru up to the Ecuadorian coast, maybe even as far as Mexico. They intercepted it, and it was filled with gold, silver, and all kinds of goods, uh, tons and tons of goods on this ocean-going raft. And probably the most important thing was they kidnapped or took 
captive a number of the sailors on the boat, and they knew some of the languages spoken by the South American groups, in particular Quechua, um, which the Inca spoke. So they actually had translators, um, which made the conquest of Peru much easier. Um, Pizarro made landfall in northern Peru in, um, in the early 1530s and um, was immediately greeted um, fairly well, fed, um, and set up a base camp in what is presently uh, Tumbes, Peru. He heard about the Inca army and the Inca king being present in northern Peru and Cajamarca, so they made a quick march to that place, um, confronted Atahualpa, the last Inca king. You see here a, a fanciful image of um, that first encounter. Um, the Spanish uh, realized they were completely outnumbered by possibly 80,000 Inca troops against 168 conquistadors. Um, well-armed, but uh, so they figured they had to do something desperate. So the next day, they um, uh, set, uh, set their guns afire and also sent horsemen out to kidnap or can um, um, make captive at a Walpa off of his um, uh, litter. So you see in this very fanciful later scene um, of what that might have been. Um, now, why, how could the Spanish do this? A small group, uh, many people look at their armor, their horses, which were intimidating for native peoples. Their armor was much more effective than the kinds of weapons that native peoples had. The surprise of sort of these new bearded men showing up out of nowhere, uh, wearing these shiny outfits that they had. Um, and a lot of it, though, has to do with history before the collapse of the Incas, in that the Incas had upset a lot of native groups that were willing to side with the Spanish and became uh, essentially the Spanish army and infantry to fight the Incas and uh, gradually gain control over um, the entire South America. Um, one of the most impressive things related to this topic is the ransom of Atahualpa, and um, it's hard to estimate exactly how much gold and silver was actually obtained through the ransom, but um, some people say 24 tons of gold and silver. And um, typical of many of these early conquistadors, especially the ones were, um, looking for El Dorado, they were ruthless folk, and um, they garroted and uh, strangled Atahualpa, uh, reneging on their uh, pledged to set him free after the gold had um, been brought. Um, after that, there were a number of uh, very weak Inca kings that um, escaped Cusco and went down into the tropical forests beyond Machu Picchu into the jungles of e uh, southeastern Peru. And um, with these, uh, we know that they took a lot of their gold and silver that the Spanish didn't get. And the idea is that maybe this stuff is somewhere buried down there in some kind of a lost Inca city. Um, like all peoples in the world, Andean peoples liked gold and silver in particular. Uh, they had symbolism for it, um, and it was um, the kind of thing that was used to dress their rulers, adorn their deities, and m much of the incredible uh, artifacts that we have here at Penn and elsewhere throughout the world um, are various kinds of ornament that were meant to show off the human body. Some examples of this um, is the Lord of Sipan, a uh, recent uh, find about 20 years ago in northern Peru. Incredible headdresses, um, especially flamboyant and, uh, when they're worn above the head, um, which would have been impressive in the sun. Native peoples uh, found gold uh, the way that all other peoples find gold. Um, a lot of digging in the ground through dangerous mines, and a lot of it was from placer deposits in rivers, um, usually most of the rivers uh, flowing down towards the Amazon. Uh, many of these carry gold deposits. And um, one of my colleagues, uh, Steve Epstein at the Penn Museum, uh, he used to be a deputy director here. Years ago, he worked on a project in northern Peru where they actually excavated a whole kiln site, an industrial site, where uh, copper and other metals were processed. And this involved incredible labor-intensive systems of blowing through tubes into kilns to raise the temperature enough to form ingots and then melt that that could be used for various uh, gold objects. I show some of the work, a team of three, an experiment of blowing. So one guy blows for a minute, the other guy blows, the other guy blows, and you raise the temperature up. They just cycle through this over and over again for hours to raise the temperature up high enough. Indian peoples developed most of the major techniques of uh, gold and silver working. You see some of the um, um, examples of some of the techniques here. 
This is from our Penn Museum collection from Colombia, um, a literal breast piece that was worn around the neck. Um, a lost wax um, little container about this tall that was used for storing uh, probably lime for chewing coca leaf from Colombia. And um, a chimu in, uh, quero for drinking corn beer stands about this tall from our collections. Now one of the earliest stories uh, comes before the arrival of the Spanish, the, the, a story that was passed down through oral history uh, and then later recorded by Spanish scribes about an Inca expedition of Topa Yupanqui Inca, um, who was uh, uh, about the fifth from the last Inca king, um, down into the tropical forest, marching for um, weeks, maybe a month, um, possibly taking a river route down into what we think is um, the Amazonian region of southern Peru, and then cutting across the frontier of modern-day Bolivia into the heart of the upper Amazon. And they described uh, something like, I think it was several thousand warriors accompanied uh, the king himself that went down. And they settled there for about a year, um, met with the local folk, uh, decided that they wouldn't try to conquer them because the local peoples outnumbered them. They didn't find the gold and silver that they wanted. Some of the Incas actually, according to these accounts, stayed there in the jungle. The rest returned back to Cusco. And so this set up a lot of stories um, kind of set the stage for Paititi or El Dorado in the, um, the Western Amazonian region of South America. And uh, many uh, modern explorers are still searching for this um, particular city. Some of the characteristics of the myth that occur over and over again, that's what kind of makes it a coherent myth, is that it's usually a story that's told by a native traveler who came out of the unknown areas outside of the Spanish realm and comes in and tells stories about a lake and a large city. Sometimes the lake is in an island in the lake. Sometimes it's on the shore. A rich civilization, lots of people, very populous, very flourishing. And sometimes um, attached to this is the story, the myth of the Amazon women, which I'll return to a little bit later. Now, all expeditions um, start from finance because these were expensive to run. Um, you'll see some of the scale of some of these in a few minutes of how many people um, and all the equipment that was used on some of the larger ones. And so the king of Spain was essentially the boss of everybody, and you would approach him and give a proposal about what you might want to explore. He would approve or disapprove it. Uh, the king's interest uh, was that the crown received the royal fifth, so 20% of whatever you found, and if it was a tomb, they got 50% of it. Um, they didn't supply anything, just signed the piece of paper, the contract, so you had to go out, raise your funds, um, usually from um, rich merchants, usually on seacoast towns, uh, get ships together, and then try to find an army of people, equipment, uh, horses, all these things uh, were very expensive. Um, now the Spanish in their early entradas from um, the northern part of South America and then eventually the conquest of Peru, they found lots of gold and silver. And um, many of the groups, even way outside of the areas where you would naturally find it today, um, had gold and silver ornaments, ma many of them similar to the ones I just showed you. And they proudly wore these as necklaces, headpieces, and things like this. So the Spanish, um, everywhere they went, they found a little bit of it. Um, in some areas, not uh, huge quantities. And one of the early um, sort of solidifications of this myth came in 1542 by um, Fernandez de Oviedo, who uh, wrote an account that was very popular and published and widely read in Europe and also in the Americas about El Dorado and also um, some of the eyewitness exploration by Jimenez de Quesada in uh, what is now Colombia and the Muisca area of native, native peoples. So in this, in this one of these stories is there's a guy, this king, who every morning he wakes up, he spreads his arms, and assistants come and they blow gold dust all over him to decorate him. So essentially, he's not wearing the gold, it's adhering to his body. And in some accounts, the Spanish are more specific, that they use some kind of a gum or a resin to sort of stick it to, to the king. And then at the end of the day, he washed it off and repeated it every day. Um, and this, this is the most common story. 
But there are all kinds of weird things that get um, added to it, um, like uh, Ra uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's account of El Dorado search in um, Guyana, um, the, the, these headless peoples with their mouths and eyes on their chests, um, and all kinds of sort of monstrous figures are added to what appear to be pretty uh, straightforward eyewitness accounts in other ways. And then one of the things that attracted the Spanish were the number of lakes in Colombia, and Colombia had a lot of gold um, before the arrival of the Spaniards. And so um, this idea of lakes, and this lake for some reason they were fixated on, and it's a meteorite impact crater, so it doesn't have a good drain to it, it's very deep, and the Spanish tried uh, four or five times um, to with miners to drain this lake. Later periods with industrial pumps and things, they all sort of failed. One got it down almost dry, and they were able to scrape some gold offerings that had been placed in the lake at various times. And the Colombian government finally decided to put an end to this because it was possibly destroying any context that might remain. But from one of these lakes, probably not this one, um, they found this golden raft. It's about this big. It's one of the treasures of the um, National Bank of Colombia. And it shows a raft with a bunch of 10 people on it, uh, sort of attendants, and then a large figure in the back there, which has been interpreted as the El Dorado Man. Now, what was driving all this? Um, well, certainly gold fever, and the Spanish probably had it more than anybody. But they're also looking for a way to get across the Americas into the South Sea. And so the ones that were going towards South America were trying to find the South Sea uh, passage. And so a lot of the rivers were explored for that reason. Um, looking for lost kingdoms, um, search for mines to have a continual source of revenue. Um, and also there was a lot of overpopulation in Spain at the time, um, very poor people who were looking for a new life. And um, also um, a medieval gold science idea that um, the best gold was found where the sun shines the brightest. And so you would expect to find it in the tropical regions. And that was one of the reasons why they focused on the Amazon. Um, they also said that silver was a cooler um, metal that was more formed by the, by the moon and by colder temperatures that you would find in the higher latitudes. So um, one of the, um, probably my favorite character in, the story, in these stories is um, a guy named Garcia Lejo, who um, was a, a Portuguese um, explorer who was on the um, Dias de Solis expedition in 1515, so before Pizarro had conquered the Inca Empire. And um, he, he was shipwrecked uh, probably off the coast of, Par uh, of Uruguay, maybe uh, the coast of Argentina, but most likely Uruguay, southern Brazil possibly. And uh, most of the crew was immediately captured and eaten. Uh, for some reason, um, uh, the six of the sailors um, um, were allowed to live, and they became very friendly with the local peoples. Um, I think. Um, Alejo was probably very smart. He learned the language very quickly. These were cannibals, so not easy uh, to work with. Um, and, um, and so he you know, became, sort of went native. And um, these peoples, um, there was a very populous, um, mostly Guarani speakers along the coast, um, Tupi, along the southern coast of Brazil and Uruguay. And, they told him stories of El Dorado um, in their language, whatever that was, and um, said that, you know, we go, and we go to El Dorado regularly to raid it. And he said, what? You know, I said, well, let's go. Can I go with you? He said, yeah. So they um, formed an expedition and started off with, I think, several hundred native peoples. Um, and then as they got uh, across what would be the present day border of Bolivia, um, walking westward many, many months, they uh, took on another several thousand local um, native peoples to form a huge army to walk to the base of the Andes and up some of the valleys to attack the Incas. And they give specific names of the Inca names of the sites so we know exactly where they went on these, uh, on these accounts. And um, we also know from the Inca side, recorded by the Spanish, that these chiriguanos, they call them, were these sort of nasty jungle, um, uncivilized peoples that would come up and raid their, um, their, civilization, their, their frontier forts and communities, stealing their gold and silver, women, and anything they could sort of haul off. And so um, uh, Alejo uh, went all the way back from the Andes across the continent 
Um, he, didn't, he only made it to the Paraguay River, or possibly the Paraná River, and um, was attacked by uh, non-friendly native peoples and died, uh, but the, his son lived to tell the story. And then later, many years, another conquistador found a huge trove of silver objects that were probably part of the ones that were lost on his return. Another very important expedition was that of Gonzalo Pizarro. He was the younger son, by I think about 20 years or so, um, of Francisco Pizarro, the Grand Conquistador of Peru. And he was made governor of Quito. He was a pretty nasty guy, um, from what, what we know about him from many accounts. Um, and he decided to lead an expedition to the land of Cinnamon, to the, supposedly at the east of Quito, Ecuador. And he chose as his captain, second in command, Francisco de Orellana. And Orellana was a really bright guy. He'd lost an eye um, to previous um, battles with native peoples um, in the various campaigns in the Andes. And um, he, uh, very important is that he brought along a priest whose name was Gaspar de Carvajal, who wrote a very, very detailed account, which is available in English also. But these expeditions were um, quite dramatic. Um, you think of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people moving across the landscape, um, sometimes through narrow trails, which certainly turned muddy with so many passage, horses, um, all kinds of animals. They brought their own food, um, so uh, they would bring uh, swine, large pigs, um, that were raised in advance um, so they could fund these sort of expeditions. They also brought, uh, this one brought, I think, about 1,000 to 2,000 war dogs. These were giant, like Great Dane-like sized dogs that were ferocious and very intimidating for any foe. Um, and a lot of the native peoples were, were terrified of these beasts. Um, they also brought lawyers along um, who were supposed to make sure that the king was represented on the expedition. So they had to do these um, speeches to native peoples, whether they were there or not. You had to you know, claim the land for the king and go through all this um, you know, legalistic um, speech. And then it would be written down by a scribe. Um, and they usually also brought along someone to sort of do the day-to-day -day recording. Um, but also, probably the main component of the resources of these expeditions were native peoples. And um, in most cases, for every Spaniard, you might have had up to uh, 50 to 100 native peoples were brought along in some cases um, to essentially haul the, the loot when they found it and to haul the food and equipment um, to get there. So for this, this was a, not a super large expedition. There were 220 Spaniards, mostly very young people, kind of unemployed youth that were hanging around Quito that were um, itching for something good to do and to make a name for themselves. 2,000 pigs, 1,000 to 2,000 war dogs, hundreds of llamas, which died when they got down to the jungle because it's a highland animal, and 4,000 native peoples. Most of these were in chains. Um, they didn't have enough chains for all of them, so they put ropes around their necks, and they carried all of the gear for the Spaniards. Uh, most of them died very soon as they were not adapted to the tropical forest regions. So soon, like all of these expeditions, they run out of food within the first month. And um, they upset all the native groups that they come across. They, you know, most of them are received at first very welcomingly and given feasts, um, beer, um, you know, live in the village. But the Spanish get greedy and they start ripping jewelry off of people's necks and um, start enslaving the local peoples. And so they have no source of food. So they're in desperation, they're starving, they're eating their saddles, um, they're boiling the saddle leather to get some nutrition out of it in their pots. So they decide they, they take all the dead horses that have died and they, they've eaten, take their horseshoes, make nails, cut down the trees at one of the headwaters of the Amazon and build a, a fairly large boat that could hold 60 people. And then Francisco de Orellana decides he will take that downstream to find food for the larger group, which will stay at the port. All along the way, they hear the native drums, and these are large signal drums that are used to communicate long distances along the rivers. And they start seeing community after community after community. And um, these are well-stocked communities. They have uh, granaries full of supplies, all kinds of animals that are uh, not domesticated, but uh, wild animals that are kept alive in pens uh, for their protein and very thriving societies. 
probably the most remarkable for the archaeologists, is the descriptions of villages that ran for five leagues without a break along the Amazon. So a league is about what you can walk in an hour. So like a five-hour walk you know, along the shores, and you don't have a break in the villages. So this means that there were very, very large populations here. And the word spread that the Spanish were not treating people well, so as they got, so he, just, he decides that there's no way we can go upstream against the current. That was a mistake to say we'll come back. So we're gonna ride this out, and the Spanish knew that the river would eventually get to the Atlantic because they could see the discharge at the mouth of the Amazon, and they knew that it was draining a big area. So they figured they would end up there eventually. So they, they found as they were going down through the probably what is now Santarem and down uh, through Manaus and Belém, um, essentially archers would stand on the shore, thousands of them, and use their boat as target practice. And they described their boat being, looking like a porcupine with all of these arrows stuck in it. And they fought numerous battles. Many Spaniards died um, of the 60 men. Um, they were down, I think, to about half. Um, many of them had wounds. Many of them were very sick. They also describe the Amazons, um, and there's a big chunk of the text uh, that was recorded, of these women um, who formed armies. They lived in their own town, supposedly, along the Amazon. They um, amputated one of their breasts so they could shoot their bows better. And, um, and a lot of people have been interested in the story, um, whether it's true or not. Some people say yes, some people no. And it goes back to a lot of European folk tales and myths also, um, and probably has more European origin than um, South American. So they eventually, after a year and I think two months, they arrive at the mouth of the Amazon and they take the currents up across northern South America to one of the ports in Trinidad um, to essentially save themselves from this journey. But they uh, talked about this incredible journey, these large groups of peoples that lived along the Amazon. Another of these famous, cabeza, uh, uh, famous explorers was Cabeza de Vaca. Um, unfortunately, the name um, uh, Cowhead. But he was famous because he had spent a lot of time exploring North America and northern Mexico. Um, he fought in many of the earlier campaigns and spent a lot of his own resources at failure of trying to find El Dorado. So he decided he would go to um, South America. He went to um, what is now Buenos Aires, went up the La Plata River with a huge army. Um, many expeditions had gone this route up the Paraná River, and then he chose to go up the Paraguay River, which is closer to the heart of the Amazon. He took along um, Ulrich Schimmel, who was um, a very interesting German mercenary, who uh, was also very literate and wrote a beautiful account uh, describing many of his uh, firsthand experiences on this. And they describe huge populations of native peoples, uh, village after village along these uh, rivers, um, in the multiple thousands per village, uh, one after the other. Uh, there was a lot of warfare at this time, so many of these villages were fortified, and there was a lot of movement, um, of people uh, being displaced by other groups. Uh, one of the ones they describe in great detail are the Carios, which are probably the Guarani. Um, they fought deadly battles with the native peoples, and um, the Spaniard, most of the Spaniards wanted to have slaves. So one of the purposes of doing these battles, which might put the Spanish at great risk, was you get a chance to get maybe 100, 200 slaves for yourself. And um, there are accounts of 1,000 uh, native peoples dying a day, 2,000 to 3,000 uh, taken slavery by um, the Spaniards and their native allies. And they arrived at a place, um, which they, were, they tried to arrive at a place uh, of a large lake that they'd heard that had the city of El Dorado. And they described it as a sort of a great shallow lake that extends with beautiful uh, buildings on it, uh, dense populations. And uh, probably a lot of these stories were referring to the Pantanal region, which isn't really a lake, it's a series of small lakes, but in the rainy season it turns into this vast wetland. And uh, they explored as much of it as they could, couldn't find the cities. So then they went to the east towards Bolivia. Uh, some of the expeditions probably reached the base of the Andes um, in their exploration um, and seeking another lake, um, which they never found. But they came back with lots of new stories and sort of new ideas about where this El Dorado would be found. So I'm gonna switch here a second. Sorry. 
can't see from here. <laughs> So one of the, probably the most important impacts um, was a very sad one of the Spanish exploration was that they brought in diseases, in addition to slavery, things like this, that native peoples did not have resistance to. Typhoid, typhus, smallpox, measles, and all kinds of flu strains that they had no resistance for. And some people argued there might have been 100 million people living in the Americas, and um, up to maybe 90% of them uh, were wiped out in the first 100 years of the conquest. And so these expeditions were essentially spreading disease throughout South America. So what happened was there's nobody there um, when modern archaeologists and ethnographers go out there into the Amazon region. It looks kind of wild. Um, you know, we think of Amazon as a high, uh, dense tropical forest like some of these scenes here, and uh, very little evidence of human occupation. And um, most of the native peoples, um, to survive the colonial experience, left the river areas where they normally would live, went into the interiors, broke up the small groups um, so they could be mobile, um, and left you know, the big, big village life and civilizations that they had before. And so um, what we thought was typical in ethnographies from the 1900s and even sometimes up to the present, there's some scholars that kind of believe that native peoples of the Amazon today are very typical of what they would have been like in the past. Another um, was a series of hypotheses by Betty Meggers of the Smithsonian um, Institution, who argued that there were environmental limitations to any development of civilization. Thus, any of the Spanish accounts about large populations were just made up lies. And um, one of our arguments was the soils of the Amazon, which in general, soils in the Amazon are pretty poor, so they could not sustain intensive agriculture that sustains civilizations. And so using slash and burn agriculture, which they thought uh, was the typical of today and in the past, um, peoples need to have lots of forests to clear and move around in. So you can't have large dense populations that um, would potentially develop into civilizations and complex societies. She also argued that the technology was very poor. Um, the Incas, Aztecs, Maya had a much better technology than Amazonian peoples. Um, most, uh, most common tool was a digging stick, you see here, for turning the soil, and stone axes, which are very inefficient for clearing forest. So they were sort of, uh, they, they couldn't evolve because of these um, various limitations. Others argued that there's not enough protein in the Amazon to sustain large groups of people. And so uh, the idea was that um, because it's so easy to overhunt areas that you could never have many dense uh, occupations. But there were, you know, archaeologists, some archaeologists looked at the early Spanish accounts, reread them very carefully, and said, well, you know, this, they're finding these huge populations, um, and you know, could we maybe find those archaeological sites? And so, um, you find pottery such as these are along the uh, central Amazon, the famous dark earth, which is um, these huge deep sites extending sometimes um, um, uh, for seven kilometers along areas of the central and parts of the lower Amazon, uh, single sites, uh, which are probably the same ones that were described by, um, um, by Carvajal and Oriana. Um, and these uh, today are being studied by my Brazilian colleagues. Um, you can see what looked like stones coming out of the very black soil there. That's, those are all potsherds. So the Penn Museum and my project has been working in an area um, that has been claimed to be the heartland of Paititi or El Dorado. Um, it's a large area of savannas, um, wetlands to, directly to the east of the border between Peru and Bolivia, uh, present day in Bolivia. You see Lake Titicaca there in the lower left-hand corner. Many of you may have traveled there. During about half of the year, the lake the area is like a big shallow lake of wetlands. Um, you get six months of rain, flooding. It's a very flat landscape. But in the 1960s, my colleague William Denovan found these incredible earthwork features across the landscape. These are what we call raised fields. Um, the dark areas are, uh, have water in them, so they're lower. The drier areas show up as a little bit lighter there. Some of these patterns um, look like they're sort of floating on the landscape. And forest islands, um, some of these artificial, some natural, um, that uh, today are sort of like hummocks that you've, if you may have seen in the Everglades. Most of it's wide open savanna. 
And there uh, were about 40 native groups in the area when the Spanish um, conquered this area and brought missionaries out into it, uh, mainly the Arawaks, which were probably responsible for many of the earthworks. So my team, uh, I made up of Bolivians and um, Americans, a number of students from Penn, they're working on various earthworks that we find um, on these landscapes and trying to address issues of uh, what was going on here in the past and um, does it relate anyway to these large populations uh, that the Spanish describe. And so my main interest, I was drawn to this because of these, um, we call these raised fields, and we know that they were used for agricultural purposes. In some areas, you can fly for 15 minutes in a small plane and not see a single break in these. They literally go to the, the horizon. And we know quite a bit about these from our excavations and also from experiments that we've done with some of the local communities. Uh, we tried um, growing native crops on them. This is um, what it looks like in the dry season and then the same field in the wet season, so you can see how they function with, when the water rises. Did a number of experiments on whether they could sustain large populations, what kind of production you can get from them. And um, also we found incredible uh, transportation networks connecting the various sites that we've located on the landscape. These are raised causeways, and the Spanish described in some of the early um, entradas or entrances into this area of uh, being able to ride six horses abreast, so side by side, across one of these causeways. So there are grand avenues raised up three or four feet above the surface. Um, you can see a double one here going from one forest island to another. And these were um, probably multi-purpose in that you raise a surface that's a dry roadbed to walk without wading through the water during the rainy season. They're probably tree-lined to keep shade um, during hot days. And then they had canals alongside that they'd used to scoop the soil out. And these could, um, you know, as long as you have a little bit of water in them, you could skim across these very easily. We also found tens of thousands of what we call sort of canoe ruts, for lack of a better word. Um, and these are little depressions perfectly straight, sometimes running for several kilometers across the landscape, and they probably run from household to household uh, between forest islands. And so you would pull your canoe along like that people do today across these flooded landscapes. I'll show you an example of how many there are. So this is a black and white image of two forest islands, adjacent ones, and we map these. Um, I mean, this one has, I think it's uh, 350 individual passageways from one forest island to the other. It's almost as if any, every person on the island you know, had their own roadway. Um, and all kinds of canoe cuts through um, forest islands to um, cut time down from having to go around these. And they create this incredible network of, um, of roadways and, and canals that connect um, a very, very large area of about 500 square kilometers um, of landscape. And um, when you think about this, if it was densely populated and flooded during the rainy season, this could be sort of the lake and the big city that a lot of the Spanish were describing. We also know from some of the poorly designed roads that were built today is that on one side of these during the rainy season, the water is usually about three feet higher than the other sides because they didn't put enough drains in here. And so we realized that these causeways or roadways that provide transportation might also serve as hydraulic works. So we can do sort of some you know, stylized sort of simula simulations here to show how during the rainy season, um, an almost flat landscape, but not quite, it's got a little bit of relief, the water will flow uh, between the high ground of one river and another, and you can block it or dam it up behind it. And probably not very deep, maybe two, three, four feet, but millions and millions of cubic um, meters of, of water. And then as the dry season occurs, it sort of dries up, but you can hold the water in the landscape probably far into the dry season to maybe get an extra crop out or to use it to, to traverse these landscapes to visit your neighbors on forest islands. Um, and then these form webs within the raised field systems, providing a way to raise and lower water tables, probably at will, to have the optimal levels for the kind of farming that went on. And then one last thing I'll talk about is an incredible system for providing protein. So we know now the native peoples primarily in the Amazon in the past got their protein not from hunting wild animals in the forest, and they had very few domesticated animals, but they did it through fishing. So many, most, the largest groups lived along the major rivers that were rich in fish, 
If they didn't have access to the fish, they created the habitats for the fish. So essentially these are huge fish farms um, that they created with the causeways to keep water on this landscape and to corral fish that leave the river to spawn during the rainy season and they, and they feed up in the savannas. And then when the rainy season ends and it starts to dry up, they, they try to seek their way back to the rivers. Um, and many of them get trapped in these systems even today. We found these what we call zigzag causeways that don't seem to make a lot of sense for transportation because they have zig and a zag, zigzag. Um, it's not the you know, most direct route between where you want to start and where you want to go. We found that these are probably fish weirs. And so you would take a basket, something like this. Um, it has a back strap handle on it. And so you take it out in the morning, you put it down in your entrance to one of the Vs of the zigzags. And then um, you go do your work, come back at the end of the day, and you've probably got five or six pounds of fish. Um, the backpack can be put on your, you know, the whole trap can be put on your uh, shoulder and walk back to the house. A very passive way of collecting huge quantities of protein to s support the large populations that we um, infer. Also, these are always associated with artificial fish ponds. Some of them are about the half size of this auditorium, maybe three, four feet deep, um, filled with sediments today. But they're teeming with fish, so many fish in them when we went out on our first exploration in 1996 that you could reach in the pond and grab a fish with your hand. There are that many of them. And what this does is it allows you to store the fish for a certain amount of time live. The trees that grow are probably planted there. Those are royal palms. They provide a fruit that drops into the pond to feed the fish so they're not going to starve while you're, while you're waiting for them uh, when, you, when you need them. And um, the, also the trees provide shade to keep the evaporation down. So I'm going to skip through. So um, we also know from, um, I do a lot, most of my work is on landscapes, but my colleagues work on on archaeological sites, and so we have good surveys now. Um, a landscape probably looks something like this. Huge tail-like formations of earth, uh, sometimes multi-platformed, covered with houses connected by roadways, crisscrossing through a very open landscape. Um, this is not your typical forested Amazon. And another feature that I've been studying over the last couple of um, years is what we call ring ditches. And these are an um, incredible discovery. Um, some of my Brazilian colleagues have found 180 of these. Uh, we've mapped about 150 in Bolivia. Um, so you can see this sort of dark ring there. You see a modern town there on the right for scale. These are deep, massive, monumental ditches that are constructed, sometimes going down about uh, 30, 35 feet, uh, sometimes 20, 30 feet across, and sometimes in closing areas of about almost a square mile. Um, so you think of the amount of labor, sometimes in the base of these they're cutting through stone to get to carve out the bottom parts of these um, using very simple tools which must have meant an impressive amount of labor. Here's one that's fairly well preserved, my Bolivian colleagues uh, mapping it, uh, trying to get the volume metric calculations so we can figure out how many person days it would have constructed these. We know from the Spanish descriptions these were probably palisaded, and in some cases with multiple palisades. And I played around with a lot of the figures that were, you know, to build one of these and maintain it with the jungle rot that you'd have to probably replace the posts periodically every 10 years or so. This is um, an incredible number of trees, probably in the millions were created just for the ones that we found in our archeological surveys if they were palisaded like this all the way around. So could this be El Dorado? Well, we haven't found gold and silver. I, um, uh, one of my colleagues found a little headpiece from what he calls a shaman burial of a little reflective uh, piece of copper. Um, that was his treasure. Um, and we'll probably find some gold and silver someday, um, but certainly not in the quantities that the Spanish wanted. Um, but probably a lot of these stories about the great cities in the Amazon probably relate to these finds and the finds of some of my colleagues working in the upper Xingu region of Brazil and also on the central Amazon, finding incredible sites, um, a w wide variety of what they are calling civilizations, complex societies that rival those of the Andes and Mesoamerica. And so will we find any real El Dorados, um, the kind that the, you know, the modern explorers want to find? Well, probably there's some out there. Um, you know, once in a while, people are going to find them. Um, but I think for me, El Dorado is really uh, doing the archaeology to essentially give this history back to the native peoples um, 
of this grand legacy that they had in the past before the arrival of the Spanish. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. We have time for questions. Uh, thank you, Clark. We have time for questions. And in the aisles of the auditorium, there are two microphones on stands. So if anyone in the, in the audience has a question for Dr. Erickson, please feel free to step up to a mic, and uh, we'll see if we can answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I was curious how the war dogs were used. Why so many of them? There's a thousand war dogs in a party of uh, 200 Spaniards. Also, uh, the idea of the Amazon being a paradise, you know. But when I uh, recall in reading uh, the velocity of Z, the, the Amazon really does not provide that much nutrition for uh, continuous uh, habitation. I mean, it's for today, anyway. Could you? So, uh, two, so two questions. Um, one about the war dogs, or the war hounds, I guess they call them. Um, I don't know much about uh, Spanish military history, but they played a very important role in the conquest of the Americas. And um, you know, these were dogs that could literally rip humans apart. And we had a number of them attacking you. You know, there was no, no way out. And, um, and they were also, you know, they were, they were used as a terror device by the Spanish. But in practical terms, most of them got eaten by the Spaniards when they ran out of food. So um, they were the first to be eaten. Then the horses were eaten. And, um, so you know. they served a dual purpose. Right. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I don't know, they, they dropped out after a, a period, um, you know, but it was certainly the early conquistadors relied on them very heavily. Um, the other question was about um, sort of uh, the Amazon as a, a wet desert or a counterfeit paradise, as some people call it. And um, a lot of this is um, from, comes from Europeans, whites, who go to the Amazon and starve to death. or nearly starved to death if they wrote the story they came back. Um, and so they had a hard time in the Amazon. And um, I read very carefully um, the Fawcett account, Percy Fawcett account, The Lost City of Z uh, by David Gann. And um, he, you know, his whole book is essentially, uh, all the diaries are about how they're starving and how they need to find food. But part of the problem with that expedition and many of these is they did not rely on the native peoples who know the landscape, you know. So I, I, I work in very remote areas in the Bolivian Amazon, and we never have any trouble finding food. I and mean, we take some with us, but we find we don't eat off the land sometimes too. And um, you know, it's because I work with native peoples who know that landscape. And I think in the case of Fawcett and many other explorers, recent and in the past, they didn't rely on the expertise of the native peoples. Thank you. This may be very trivial. In all the images but one, the bows were depicted as sinew back bows, Turkish bows, double, double bent bows. Is this Spanish fantasy? Or did somehow that form of bow get to South America? Yeah, I should have explained more about the, the, the images. Most of them were from Debris, and he published many, many books of these early accounts, beautiful um, 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 line drawings that were, re were reproducible in these early printing presses. And um, unfortunately, you had, you had the eyewitness accounts, usually written years after the person left, you know, went back to Spain and went to the capital city of Lima or Quito. And so sort of memories are a little bit, maybe a little bit faded. And then these get published in Europe. And so they hire artists because of you know, high illiteracy. They want to have lots of graphics to show these new worlds. And so the artists never went to the new world. The only one I think that I know of the early accounts is von Staden, who did his own uh, simple drawings for his book. And so um, they're relying on sort of the other, all these other peoples that Europeans are encountering in Africa and Asia and um, South Asia and the Pacific Islands. And so all of this sort of gets moshed up and mixed up. Um, and also this idea that the peoples they're encountering are similar to very ancient peoples of Europe, you know, um, before they got civilization. So there's a lot of, you know, with the barbarian image that gets reproduced in these. Um, so there's a, if you look very carefully, you know something about military weaponry, um, you know, you'll, you'll see that a lot of these don't make a lot of sense. Thanks. Hi, I've always found the story of uh, Lake Guadavita mm -hmm. particularly engrossing. And uh, I was wondering if you knew of any estimates of the amount of gold that might have been removed already and might be left in there. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. 
So how, how much did they find? Well, probably if you found it, you weren't going to report it all, right, um, for tax purposes. And it was tax because the, the king would take 20% of it. Um, so, uh, but the king often sent accountants along on these things to make sure you know, um, that, that there was a treasurer um, on some of these expeditions. And um, stationary ones like that that aren't moving around the landscape, they're there for years trying to drain this lake, you know, they could be monitored. And um, I don't know exactly from that particular lake um, that in some of the Spanish accounts, they use various uh, weight estimates and sometimes what it without wasn't really high. They're beautiful objects, and that's the sad thing about this El Dorado thing, is the Spanish didn't care about the objects, which we now appreciate so much. They wanted the gold, so they just immediately, in many cases, melted this down into ingots. And one of the tricky things about trying to assign European value to these is that it's not pure gold in most cases, because it's mixed with copper, and Native peoples like the glow of uh, red that it gave to the gold, so they mix copper in a certain percentage percentage, I think 10 to 15, maybe 20 percent sometimes, and also made it more workable. So um, I really don't know how much um, they got. And, uh, there are various estimates about um, Pizarro and his 160 conquistadors, and they split the loot there, even with the cut for the king, got a lot. But it was the second, third wave of Spaniards that were desperate for this and driving a lot of this El Dorado exploration. Uh, perhaps this is a personal misconception that I've labored under, but I've long been taught that societies of this scale didn't exist largely in either of the Americas. In your professional opinion, why is that? Is it a cultural guilt that many people are dealing with, or is there a more objective reason the materials that they use to build these societies are harder to preserve, and therefore we don't have as much evidence for them? Well, we have good evidence for the Aztecs and the Maya and the Incas. You know, and those are sort of the star three cultures that you find in a coffee table book on archaeology. But um, archaeologists and historians are generally um, not too uh, willing to grant civilization status um, to uh, North American groups, uh, north of Mexico, and to Central America, and certainly the Amazon region. And I think we're finding in, through modern archaeology, uh, these areas got sort of bypassed um, by a lot of the early archaeology. With, with the recent research, we're showing that these societies were probably on par with any of the other more known ones, uh, but they were organized in very different and often non-hierarchical ways. And um, we're now sort of beginning to appreciate some of this richness of ways of forming complex societies without sort of the standard kind of Western idea of states you know, organized in hierarchical fashion. And um, um, there are a lot of really great summaries of this work. Um, if you don't want to read the sort of the boring archaeology part, uh, you can go to Charles Mann's book, 1491, which is a wonderful summary of all these new finds. I'm just curious about the, uh, the constructions of this earthworks in the savannah and what kind of materials the folks had that were building it. I mean, did they have, did they uh, mine stone? Did they smelt metal? Were they, uh, did they use wood to build these things? Was it right there or was there trade bringing it in from other distances uh, so that the materials they had to make these very enormous and impressive objects or landscape features? Yeah, in this area, there are no, um, uh, very few stone deposits, um, and stone was so important for peoples in the Americas for cutting implements, um, sort of household goods, axes for cutting trees down, and adzes for carving out dugout canoes. So these were traded long distances into the area. We, the Spanish also describe a lot of the gold ornaments that I showed you that these peoples possess, but they don't have access to placer mines and throughout most of the area where I work. So they had to come from the Andes or further into the Brazilian uh, central highlands. And so um, a lot of this moved through trade. Um, they also don't have access to salt, which is so important for sustaining humans. And so um, they traded long distance, maybe as far as the Highland Andes, for a lot of their salt. And um, the um, earthworks are earthworks. Um, so you know, they, they tended to get missed by people. Um, it was by flying over it and the initial mapping of the Bolivian Amazon back in the 1950s and by oil companies looking for uh, possible petroleum deposits um, were the first to discover these earthworks and the patterns that were non-natural. And then it took many, many years for archaeologists to get out there. I, my, I arrived in the um, um, uh, brief project in the late 70s and then my big project in the 90s and a couple of smaller projects before that. But um, so most of this is, is moving of earth and is putting a lot of people power, 
um, using very simple tools, digging sticks, probably sharpened in the fire to get a sharper point, um, and baskets for probably moving the earth, um, very laborious. And we can do all kinds of calculations to, get, um, to sort of play around with figures of millions of person days of labor to create um, a complex of uh, the causeways and canals that I showed you, or even more impressive are these ring ditches or those enclosures that I showed you at the end of my talk. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, one last question. <laughs> one last question. I'm sorry. I didn't see you come up thank, to the mic. Thank you very much. Um, we journeyed to Peru and Cusco a number of years ago and were told that much of Cusco was clad in gold. Was that a creative guide or is there evidence that that was actually the case? No, we know quite a bit about it from eyewitness accounts because when the Spanish held Atahualpa, the Inca king, hostage in Cajamarca, northern Peru, Cusco's in southern Peru, he didn't trust the natives to bring all the gold to him. So he sent out um, some of his most trusted captains um, to the coast to Pachacamac, a shrine uh, that Penn has worked at a number of years ago, and also to Cusco. And so two Spaniards arrived in Cusco and did a rapid assessment of it, probably about a period of a week or less maybe, and they ripped gold plaques, huge plaques that took six people to carry uh, each plaque off of the Temple of the Sun. So at least the upper part, maybe the entire Temple of the Sun was covered. Temple of the Sun had a life-size garden and life-size herds of llamas and alpacas, um, and that was all melted down and hauled up on people's backs up to Cajamarca as part of the ransom. So, um, and then that, the Cusco became important for Spanish administration during the colonial period, so anything that was left there was, was sacked. Um, and, but you can see, still see a lot of this gold if you go to the cathedrals in, um, off the plaza in Cusco. It was melted down and put into the Spanish church context. So where that gold? Well, that, a lot of that was probably not the ransom gold, but that was gold that the Spanish found after they, they essentially conquered the Incas and, and took control of Cusco. We know that the plaza, if you've been to Cusco, there's this huge plaza there. The Inca plaza was double the size of that. And the Spanish describe it as something like, I think it's five um, hands high of ocean sand that was hauled up from the Pacific coast up to the Andes, very carefully laid out there, and then in that was tons and tons and tons of offerings of gold and silver and other precious items. And so a lot of the, probably what decorates the Spanish church, it's only just a small, minuscule amount of what was there in the past. Oh, I guess what I was asking, if you don't mind, is was that gold brought in and traded for... Okay. She's, she's asking about where did that gold come from. So um, the Spanish didn't do any mining until very late in the colonial period. So they were after stuff that's already out of the ground and you know accessible. Um, so m probably most of that comes from um, uh, melted down, you know, sort of the smaller items that the initial Spanish didn't get. Um, and also lots of exploration around Cusco, looting of tombs, things like this um, that they were accumulated. And then later the big mines in Potosí in Bolivia brought a lot of the silver that you see in many of the churches throughout South America. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Clark.